Hi, my name is Shelby Latona, a Senior Community Health Manager with Prevent Blindness Wisconsin. And today we're going to be going through our children's vision health and safety presentation. This presentation is brought to you by Prevent Blindness and the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. Prevent Blindness was founded in 1908 to work on preventing blindness and preserving sight. In 2009, the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health was founded by Prevent Blindness to serve as a national resource center on children's vision health. Today, we are going to cover a few main topics. We're going to learn the differences between a children's vision screening and a dilated eye exam. We will discuss common vision problems in young children for you as parents to pay attention to. And we'll talk through a few different vision safety topics such as digital eye strain, first aid for your eyes, firework safety, sport safety, and eating healthy for your vision. So overall with children's vision health, approximately one in five preschool aged children in the United States, including preschool aged Head Start children, has a vision problem that requires treatment and or monitoring by an eye doctor. For us, anyone preschool age is three, four, or five years old. Once we become six and older, we jump into what's called school age. When you're a school age child, about one in four school age children has a vision problem that could require treatment. Right now, in the United States, less than 70% of children report receiving an eye exam before entering school. Because of that, there's a lot of things that we as parents and caregivers can do to support children's vision health. With children's vision health, these undiagnosed and uncorrected vision problems can often go on to create barriers to learning. Next, we're going to discuss the difference between vision screenings and eye exams. An eye exam, which is done by either your optometrist or your ophthalmologist, the eye doctor, is going to diagnose and prescribe treatment if necessary for any vision disorders. Eye exams are the gold standard for vision health care. Vision screenings, on the other hand, are typically done in a community-based or school-based setting. They are considered an appropriate public health intervention for vision health care. In your, our vision screening, we are providing education and information to families and caregivers on next steps if the child was to be referred. Our role as a vision screener in the community is to provide that referral on to eye care to catch things while they're early, still treatable, and share that education and information on how to access the vision healthcare system to families. School or community-based vision screenings are very important in detecting undiagnosed or untreated vision problems. These undiagnosed and untreated vision problems can lead to learning difficulties, a loss of vision, poor school performance, developmental, social, cognitive, and emotional delays. We want to ensure that students have good vision for academic success. Next, we'll talk through some common vision problems in young children. We'll talk about the refractive errors, strabismus, and amblyopia. Now these aren't the only vision problems children may have, however, these are the most common. Refractive errors occur when there is a defect in the optics of your eye that causes a blurred image. So we have three different types that we'll talk through today. We have myopia, nearsightedness, hyperopia, farsightedness, and then an astigmatism. Now, myopia, nearsighted, you can see up close, but you struggle to see far away. So now, in our images here, we have the books, which are clear, and the chalkboard is very blurry. So myopia, we're seeing the near, we struggle to see in the distance. This is going to become evident typically in the years around puberty. Eight to 12 is when we generally see children first receiving that myopia diagnosis. It's going to be much more rare in our infants and toddlers. Squinting is the big common sign with myopia because when we squint, we're going to push on those muscles on our eye and clear up that vision a little bit, making it a little easier for children to see. However, we don't want kiddos to rely on squinting really hard in order to see. So we're going to correct this with a pair of glasses or contacts as the child gets older. Hyperopia, 
that's farsightedness. That's kind of the flip side of myopia nearsighted. So with hyperopia, farsightedness, we struggle to see up close, but we can see in the distance. So with our picture here, the chalkboard is clear, but the books are really blurry. With hyperopia, this is something that we're typically going to see from birth on. It's going to be something that we see in our younger children. Most teenagers actually will lose the majority of their hyperopic or farsighted vision by the time that they're teenagers. With hyperopia, your eye is short, and so our light rays are focusing behind where we want them to. As we grow, that eye is gonna get bigger, and that distance can kind of fix itself, leading to children growing out of their hyperopic vision. For our kiddos with hyperopia, we correct that with a pair of glasses. Our last refractive error is an astigmatism. With an astigmatism, both near and distance are blurry. This happens because the cornea is a bit misshapen. You can think of a normal cornea being shaped like a basketball or a soccer ball. The astigmatic cornea is shaped more like a football. That irregular curve is going to make the light not land where we want it to on the retina, causing a blurred image. Instead of landing on one spot, it's going to land on multiple spots, making us see that blurred image. Astigmatisms are often inherited, and they are more common in people of Hispanic descent. We tend to see more complaint signs with an astigmatism, like eye strain, fatigue, headaches, and blurry vision. Of course, we can correct an astigmatism with a pair of glasses. The next vision problem we're going to discuss is strabismus. Strabismus is a crossed or a wandering eye. This eye can go in, out, up, or down. It can be present all the time, or it may happen only occasionally. Strabismus affects about 2% of the preschool population, and we want to catch this and treat it at an early age so that it doesn't go on to be something called amblyopia or lazy eye, which I'll talk about next. To treat strabismus, we need to correct whatever the underlying condition would be. Sometimes we need to do muscle surgery. Sometimes we just need a simple pair of glasses. So treating strabismus, you'll need to see your eye doctor. Amblyopia is present in about 2-3% to of our population, but it is our most common cause of preventable vision loss in children. So we want to make sure that we're detecting it and treating it at an early age so we don't have kiddos who do end up losing vision later on in life. Amblyopia can be caused by a few different things. It can be caused by untreated strabismus, unequal refractive error where one eye sees a blurry image compared to the other eye, or by deprivation of vision, by something like a drooping eyelid or a cataract that a child was born with. With amblyopia, unless treated, we can have permanent vision loss in the amblyopic eye. Amblyopia becomes more difficult to treat after age six or seven, so we want to ensure that children are seeking eye care and going to receive the treatment that they need. Treatment can be things like glasses, an eye patch, surgery, or medication. Some children are at a higher risk for certain vision problems, and we would th want those children to go directly to the eye doctor. That would include children who were born prematurely, if they have autism or ADHD, diabetes, asthma, if they were born with a cataract, if their eyes are misaligned or you notice a wandering eye, those children can go directly to the eye doctor. The next section we'll talk through is the ABCs, or appearance, behavior, and complaints of possible vision problems. And these are things that you as a parent can look for while you're interacting with your child. Appearance signs that you may notice as a parent can include things like a red eye, a watery eye, if the eye seems crossed in or walled out to the side, if the pupils look different sizes, one's really big, one's really small, or maybe it's teardrop shaped or pear shaped, if we have crusty or swollen eyelids, if they seem clouded over or hazy, um, if we notice a white pupil, a white pupil could be something like a congenital cataract or a childhood cataract, but it can also be a sign that your child may have amblyopia and we'd want to go to the eye doctor. 
And lastly, we have any sort of possible eye injury. That's my own personal connection to vision. When I was a child, I got a stick in my eye and I severely scratched up my cornea. I needed to wear an eye patch and use some ointment for a few days in order to let that heal. Behavior signs that you might notice as a parent or caregiver would be things like rubbing their eyes, sitting close to the television, thrusting forward when they need to see, tilting their head one way or the other, holding books or tablets really close to the face, writing right on top of their paper. Those are all signs that a child could be struggling to see. And lastly, for complaints, these could be things like, it's too little, it's too blurry, my eyes are itchy, it's too bright, it's too small, I can't see that. Those are all things that a child might vocalize to let you know that they're struggling to see. However, with the ABCs, there may not be any signs at all. Just because your child is not having any appearance, behavior, or complaint signs doesn't mean there is not a possible vision problem. Especially in our young children, our three, four, and five-year-old children, if they're born seeing a certain way, they assume that's how everyone sees. The best way for us to catch these undiagnosed and untreated vision problems is through regular vision screenings. Next up, we'll talk through the leading causes of eye injury. One of the biggest leading causes that you might not think of is misuse of toys. That includes things like slingshots, toy guns, if children are throwing sand or playing with glitter, which can be abrasive and get in the child's eye. Falling down can also cause eye injury. That includes things like falling down from bed, falling down the stairs. Anytime a child could trip and fall, there is that potential for eye injury. Misuse of tools or household objects. This includes things like knives, pencils, gardening tools, or guns. Improper use of these things can cause a possible eye injury. Lastly, we have household cleaning products. This can be things like detergents, soaps, pesticides. If these were to get into the child's eye, they could cause a possible injury. Symptoms of overexposure to digital device use include things like eye strain, back and shoulder pain, blurred vision, dry eyes, and headaches. Digital screens have become a common part of a child's world, being used for interactive play, reading, learning, and to socially connect. Increased time using these digital devices, especially when held close to the child's face, can make undiagnosed vision problems worse or create new symptoms. We want to ensure that we're encouraging children to take breaks when using digital devices. We always want to follow the 20-20-20 rule. That means that every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. That gives your eyes a break when using digital devices. On average, children between the ages of 8 and 18 spend about 7.5 hours a day in front of a screen. Spending time outdoors can reduce the risk of a child developing myopia. We recommend that children do spend time outside. In order to help your child use digital devices safely, we recommend that they do not hold screens close to their face for a very long time period. If they're using a computer or laptop for schoolwork, ensure that they're set up with good posture, which includes both feet flat on the floor. Each year, emergency rooms treat 25,000 sports-related eye injuries. That includes injuries from things like soccer, basketball, baseball, even bicycling. And almost all of those injuries are preventable. Serious vision loss can occur when we are not protecting our eyes during sports. Children should wear activity or sport-specific protective eyewear during their sport or activity. Prescription eyeglasses should never be used as the protective eyewear or underneath any goggle type protective eyewear. During our sports or activities, any sort of eye injury can increase the risk for a traumatic cataract or glaucoma. When picking out your sport specific or activity specific eyewear, you want to ensure that it meets the American Society for Testing and Materials standards. Now let's get into how the sun and UV rays can affect your eyes. The UV rays from the sun can cause sunburn on your eye. They can increase your risk for macular degeneration, developing cataracts, or even skin cancer around the skin on your eyelid. 
To protect your eyes from those UV rays, you want to ensure that children are wearing UVA and UVB coated sunglasses that block 99 to 100% of those rays. Children should also be wearing a brimmed hat and staying indoors between 10 and 2, the brightest hours outside. Also, as a parent, you can avoid tanning beds to reduce your risk from UV exposure. When discussing eating right for your eyes, we always like to say if it's good for your heart, it'll be good for your eyes. That includes things like dark leafy greens, olive oil, salmon, almonds, corn, pistachios, tomatoes, carrots of course, those are all great choices. Next we'll discuss firework safety. Most of the firework related injuries occur in the month surrounding the 4th of July and the eyes are one of the most commonly injured parts of the body. And even fireworks that we might think of as safe, like sparklers, those can account for many of those injuries. About a third or more of those injuries occur into children under the age of 15. We encourage children to play with things like glow sticks, wind socks, or other light up devices and not purchase any fireworks. As a family, you should attend public displays of fireworks put on by licensed professionals. When it comes to first aid, we don't want to assume that any eye injury is harmless. We should always stock our first aid kit with a rigid eye shield and commercial eye wash. That commercial eye wash can be used to wash out an eye if maybe a child was throwing sand or they got a soap or detergent in their eye, like when we discussed those household chemicals. When in doubt, always see an eye doctor. Eliminate the hazards in your household. Model good behavior by wearing protective eyewear when you need it and encouraging your child to have that protective eyewear and wear it during their sports or activities. Model that same good behavior when outside in the sun and wearing those protective UVA and UVB blocking sunglasses. And always be prepared for emergencies. For children and adults without vision coverage, we do have a vision care voucher program please email info at preventblindness.org for more information. Please visit the National Center and Prevent Blindness's website for the following resources. If you have any questions, please contact Donna Fishman at the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health.